Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lexi Neely. I'm the program coordinator at Little Free Library, and this is Unbound. Um, my colleague Shelby and our director of programs is in the chat and is going to share some information for having the best viewing experience today. If you have any questions or technical issues, you can send a message in the chat or directly to Shelby, and she will help you out with that. Um, and I am going to hand things off to Little Free Library's National Board Chair, Anita Marina, so that we can get started today. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Little Free Library Unbound, another great chapter and great, great topic. I'm always very, very excited to, one, talk to our stewards and then, uh, you know, learn learn from them. So our chapter 21 is, is really exciting because it's about building your own little free library and, and that's exciting. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but in fact, around 60% of our registered little free libraries are created by the stewards, either by building the structure themselves or by upcycling a piece of furniture, whether it's um, a furniture or whether it's a tree, from trees to phone booths to doll houses or canoes, you know, you name it, our stewards have kind of done it and done it in such so many brilliant ways. And so um, it's nice to know that this creative spirit of Little Free Library stewards is a big part of what made um, has made the movie so successful. And as, um, as an artist, I'm a glass artist, to just kind of wander around and see what's possible and what's doable. Um, and then as we've said before, stewardship really takes a lot of different forms. We are excited to be able to share and take this opportunity to recognize these unique um, efforts. So we actually hope this um, episode will tickle your creative brain um, and give you some in inspiration if you've been thinking of building a little free library of your own. And I do want to say that, you know, there are those of us who identify as um, DIY challenge. So there's always hope. You know, we do have unassembled library kits as a great budget friendly option for those who feel that challenge. Um, but want the added assurance of a library box that's handcrafted by our own builders. So, and they've improved, they, along with our team, have improved the library kit so much that it's, you know, basically really wonderful and easy to put them together. So hats off to both the builders and uh, Little Free Library staff and stewards who often give feedback on what's, you know, what's doable and what's possible. Um, so I'm excited to introduce your panelists today. Uh, first off, we are welcoming, and Andrea, if, if you, if I mispronounced your name, just let me know. It's Andrea Gillespie, and Andrea is a retired superintendent of education and the steward of charter number um, 123215, and that's in Huntsville, Ontario, Canada. So welcome from below the border. Um, <laughs> and then our second guest is Bill Reed. Bill is a retired, also a retired educator. Um, I'm a retired any National Education Association person, so I'm very excited always to speak to former educators. And then he's the steward of Charter Number 869985 uh, 869 in McCordsville, Indiana. And finally, for our third guest, so welcome. Welcome, Bill. And our third guest is um, John Threffall, uh, Jack of many, many trades, uh, but a very um, jack of the trade of building Little Free Libraries. Um, he's the steward of charter number uh, 108759 in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And so we're excited. We're excited to see what your ideas are, what's happening. Um, so we are going to get started. And, and thank you, all three of you, for joining us. Um, so let's start with each of you to tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Little Free Library. We'll go down the road and down the line. And so, Andrea, let's start with you. How did you get involved? What got what turned you on to Little Free Library and uh, creating your own? Well, it was really a perfect storm, I think. It was the pandemic. Um, our, li our, our public library, I live 200 kilometers north of Toronto in a very rural community. Uh, the closest town to me is 20,000 people, um, but we live about eight kilometers south of that. So I live on an extremely rural road. Our local library um, 
much totally shut down uh, during COVID. And coincidentally, the only bookstore in town also shut down. So as a literacy specialist in education, I knew that wasn't okay. All I could think about was kids don't have access to books right now in our small community. And so what can I do? We're also in the process of downsizing, having recently retired. So I thought, why don't we make it a little free library? At the bottom of our driveway, we had a um, bus shelter, which I can go into later. Um, and uh, so we basically repurposed um, our, our bus shelter to become our little free library. And it really, the, really, the reason that we got involved was it was the perfect storm. It was COVID. It was no access. There was absolutely zero access to books for 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 anybody in the community. And so it was just a small courtesy that we thought we could do for our community. And it just became so much more than that as we sort of started down the journey. And the idea of, of tran transportation, it's just that you're just basically transporting these kids in a different way um, right. through books and into yeah. a new world. So this is uh, a great way to really turn them on. I, I think that's really, really exciting. And to, and uh, to be on, to, to be on, to, to be truthful, nobody should come to our library because it is so remote. It is on a, it, it, they shouldn't, it's on a, it's on a lonely, creepy, uh, treed road. There's not a whole lot around it, but we get patrons coming to our library every single day. Wow. That's so, amazing. so there's the, you know, word of mouth and our social media, I think has really helped with that. Um, but, um, you know, you don't have to, you know, they say location, location, location. Well, this is the opposite of location and it works. So it's kind of interesting. And it's become a destination, which is it has. exciting to, to think about it in that way. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll be getting back and I'm sure we'll have more questions for you. Um, let's move to Bill. So you shared also that your library design is pretty simple, but careful design really is is important to make it durable, very durable. Um, and I think you're in the Midwest, so, you know, elements being what they are, <laughs> create a challenge. So can you tell us a little bit more about what makes um, strong features for a library, Little Free Library, what's important to you, and how do you build um, a Little Free Library that lasts? So. It's kind tell of your story. Tell us your story about it and how you created it. I got started, a friend of mine who was a teacher friend of mine was a librarian, and she lived on a very busy main street and wanted to put up the little free library in front of her house, but we didn't feel it'd be safe for people to stop and, and get stuff. So she put out a call and I said, well, I live in a quiet neighborhood on a cul-de-sac, you know, we can do this. And she said, well, I already have a little free library built. And I said, okay. So I put up a post and, and we put it up. The problem is she had grabbed scrap wood that was press board and it had a flat roof and it had an indention. And we put it up in September. By March, it was soggy, expanded and falling apart. And so at that point, uh, I decided to design one that would weather Indiana weather and the joke for Indiana weather is if you don't like it, wait five minutes, it'll change. <laughs> we will go from 30 degrees to 90 degrees in a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. And so we get the rain, we get the ice, we get the snow, we get the wind, we get, in my neighborhood, leaves and branches falling on it. Mm -hmm. So as I was looking for a design, there's two things that I really suggest that you get a lot of, and that is pure silicone <laughs> to seal every joint yeah. and yeah. every crevice, and it can't hurt anything. It's safe. And the other thing that I've found that has now made mine last for over three years, and it still looks brand new, is to take a second and put a metal roof on because mm -hmm. the metal roof what I found is a metal roof sealed with as much silicone as you can pump into it pretty much seals off the library and everything kind of drains and goes off from that. So those little, those two little things, a metal roof and a, a lot of silicone, <laughs> clear silicone really 
really takes care of a lot of the problems. And, and then it's preparation of putting two or even three coats of paint on before you put it up, because that way you don't have to take it down and do it again. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the where you can get this clear silicone is every hardware store. You have those tubes. Um, I, the glass is like we use it to make molds. So, you know, it's smelly, but, you know, it's it's effective in that, you know, those those clear silicone um, applications are, are really, really critical. I think the other thing, um, you know, now <laughs> moving from, well, it's still wet. It was wet in Maryland, and now it's wet sometimes in the Pacific Northwest. So I think one of the things that I, I imagine that you and the, the, all of you do is think about the elements, but think about the change of seasons. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in a place that's now very damp and there's moss, um, you know, there's a lot of moss or things yeah. like that, you know, kind of coping with all of those. Um, I think those are really, really good. The, so the metal, the metal roofs, a quick question for you, Bill, is where can you find them, purpose them? Or what are the, the, you know, what are your sources for finding some of these? I think this is these are good tips to provide and also some of your go-to places. Like if you really want some of these things, you know, find them here and there. So I'll have you, Bill, and then, you know, I'm sure John has some uh, suggestions as well. So, Bill, why don't you take it away? Surprisingly, um, the metal roof actually ended up being cheaper than shingles um, mm -hmm. because you can go to Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, uh, whichever local hardware store and just yeah. buy a nice, I, I used, I actually got mine donated um, just in our neighborhood. They were putting up continuous feed gutter and I had the guy cut me off a piece of about two foot long and he goes, Oh, that's scrap. You can have that, <laughs> but you can get a flat sheet of metal. And then in the roofing section, they have what's called J channel. And I think at the beginning when they showed, they showed a picture of it. And you basically take 10 snips and all you do is like lay it across the front, snip a line on the back side of the J channel. And what it does is it then it just folds around and you go all the way around and seal each of the corners. So you let it overlap and seal each of the corners okay. with the um, silicone and there's no sharp edges that way. And so you have the flat piece that you lay on and then that J channel overlaps it by about two inches all the way around. And then I seal that real good with the silicone and I've not had any water get in. And even in the wettest part of the year, our books stay perfectly dry. I have not had any problem with mustiness or mold or any of those issues um, because as long as you can keep the water out, you tend to um, be able to get that. And I know I've posted a couple times in the um, Facebook uh, stewards page uh, right. some of the materials, but people can message me uh, in the stewards page, and I will get show them the details. I can give you pictures and drawings and diagrams. But, yeah, that metal roof, and then when you put it together, think about, trying to keep as many outside edges. So when I put my two sides and then the back, um, again, sealing every crevice with silicone and then screwing it together and then sealing it on the inside and outside, it may not be aesthetically perfect, but it's really good about keeping the books dry and keeping everything the way it needs to be. So I just painted over it and you really hardly can't no notice it at all. That's great because I, I know that on the stewards page, people have really been concerned about the elements and how to keep things dry. So that that's really, really helpful. And, then, and I didn't get your final notice that you can paint it, you can create artwork down in those those areas to, to make it aesthetically kind of cool looking, or you could make it look like a little book book binds, you know, book spines and things like that. So it'd be 
be very creative. Um, so we're going to move on to you, John, which is, you know, you've done a number of them, and I'm sure you have a lot of lessons you've learned. So we'd love you to tell your story, one, how you got started, which is always, that's the most fun, is how, how our stewards have gotten very uh, excited about it, how you how you gotten involved in doing Little Free Libraries, what pulled you toward them. And then, of course, since we all, I mean, I, as, a, as an artist, you know, there's a high cry factor, and then there's the challenge of figuring out not to have that cry factor involved. So, um, so let me let me quiz you on the lessons you've learned in your library builds, mistakes that you've made that others should watch for, because as you know, we like to share lessons learned and um, have the opportunity to help people avoid <laughs> avoid those hard lessons. And then um, what's the fun part of it, too? For sure. Well, I got into it. Um, so there's I live in I'm fortunate I live in a city that have a lot of libraries. But if you peel back a couple of years before COVID, um, we had about 200 in Victoria. And like most people in my city, um, Victoria is at the tip of an island, so we're a really big island on the west coast of North America. Uh, it's not a huge city, it's about 350,000, but we had about 200 little free libraries, and I was just using the libraries in my neighborhood like everybody else was just looking for books and reading and picking them up. And then um, the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, uh, similar to what Andrea was saying, uh, the libraries closed, the bookstores closed, everything closed. So my wife is a community artist, and for a number of years now, she's been involved in art projects in the community that just really help build, um, uh, just build the community, build a network of people to support each other and get involved and meet your neighbors. And so we do things like painting telephone poles. Um, we do things like uh, building a giant cardboard castle for our neighborhood festival. So we really specialize in doing the most we can for the littlest amount possible. Like we don't spend a lot of money on projects, so we try and find as much material as we can. So when, when the pandemic hit and suddenly we had time in our hands and, and not a ready supply of books, I just said, okay, well, let's take this community building a step fur further. I'm gonna put in a library in front of my house because we're right on a busy walking street in the heart of the neighborhood and lots of people go by. Um, but I didn't wanna spend a fortune on things. So I started looking around for um, found objects. So I build almost all of my libraries out of found objects, whether they're bedside tables or old plywood bookshelves or um, you know trunks, like old steamer trunks and things like that, things that pre-exist that don't cost anything really. And then you have the freedom to create what you want. So the one that at the beginning uh, on the slide that said read on it, that big thing, that's actually a bedside table that's knocked on its side. And I just created doors on it and put a tin roof on the top of it. Because like Bill was saying, you got to have that tin roof there to keep the weather off. So that's what that one was. And then I have just started accumulating things to be like, OK, how can I build a really engaging little library for people that also will survive the, the weather? be really stable and help build community by having people go, wow, look at this. W what's this made of? I can't believe this is a steamer trunk. I can't believe this is, what is this? Is this a washing machine? You know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a really great exercise in community building. And uh, post-pandemic, pre-pandemic, Victoria had about 200 little libraries. Post-pandemic, we now have over, two, uh, over 650 little libraries in a city of about 350,000. So that's a lot of libraries, and we have an interactive online map that helps people find their way around the city. And we've got different map points for puzzle libraries, seed libraries, little free art galleries, and little free libraries. You know, they, we've got different colored maps for that. And then I took it a step further, and I thought, okay, well, we have so many libraries now. It's got to be about more than just finding books, because not everybody, like Bill said, not everybody wants to read, but you want to engage. So I created a bingo game, a little free library bingo game, and I started putting the cards in my library, and they went really fast. And then we got one of the local newspapers on board, and they printed it in the newspaper. And then we put it online, and then we worked with a group of students to create um, a random category generator for an online little library bingo card. And I did one for kids, and I did one for adults, and they've become such a hit. And it's a way for people to engage with um with libraries in the city, even if you don't want a book, 
You know, it's like, oh, look, John Grisham, I've got that. Oh, is there a Harry Potter book or is there a library that's read? You know, whatever it may be. Yeah, that's that's really. I love the idea of, of the the bingos, and then also ha having a map that's interactive, and um, the opportunity to um, to have some other things. I'm just check, double checking on um, check. So um, the other thing. So I I will go back to you again, Andre. So I really love the idea of different ways to engage. So John, you touched upon it. How how engaging can we make it? So um, so I'd love to, to hear from each of you, and, and Bill actually talked about this, wouldn't it be great to do these kind of vacations, which some of our stewards actually do, a vacation to visit, really cool and creative little free libraries. And as you can see on the Pinterest page and other places, um, the fun ones you discover. Um, so Andrea, let's start with you. What are some of the fun ones you've seen or what are the creatives? Because all three of you are very creative. Um, what are some of the coolest ones that you've come across, whether it's virtually or in person, which is always fun? So um, we named our uh, Little Free Library Steve. He has the name of Steve. Um, so Steve the Little Free Library. Everybody in town knows Steve the Little Free Library. What was interesting is that um, now there's a Stanley the Little Free Library. There's a Snoopy the Little Free Library um, in our community. And um, the Stanley the Little Free Library is made out of an old electrical box. Oh, so a big gigantic true. electrical box, which I thought was really quite fascinating. The, my second favorite one is we have just come back from 10 weeks of camping on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And um, we are starting to see campers who are thinking Little Free Library, but because we're transient and we're always on the move, they are, they've are they come up with, I've seen them in little wagons. I've seen them in, um, you know, if you go into like a, a outfitter store, they, they might have a prototype of a tent, of a small tent. Huh. This is what the tent would look like. So they're actually using small little tents and then they are putting at the at their campsite. They actually have a, the little prototype of a tent with books to share, which I think is pretty fantastic. So um, it doesn't have to be a permanent structure, which I think is an interesting way of thinking about it. So um, the ones that I also really love are the ones that are incorporating art. We've incorporated art into ours, um, and so any time that um, you can, you know, add that sort of whimsical or um, um, you know, artistic flair. I think that's uh, pretty special. Ours is in a because ours is in a forest. Uh, we have the signboards. We have a fairy garden. We have a fairy door, um, and kids love that, right? So I think that 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 takes it beyond just the books. It takes it to sort yeah. of a magical place. Yeah. And um, so, Bill, so you've come across, I, I, and it's also also really conveys that whole magic of, of reading. I, one of my favorites, um, it's a young steward, I think, her, and her mother, who to, she's, hers is a, a movie theater, so you're like now playing the very cool <laughs> things. And then she was also, uh, the another art steward was using all those great um, peeps, and so it became a real appeal of, what kind of peep scene are you going to do next? Which is like the Washington Post, um, very creative peep. So, so Bill, tell me about some of the fun. So again, you were the one who brought up like, wouldn't it be great to do this little fun guide, you know, this travel log of uh, little free library visits. Um, tell me then what are some of your uh, bucket list destinations in terms of little free libraries? Well, I want to travel to some of the ones around the world. I've been very lucky in my education career. I've gotten to go to England, Japan, Brazil, Kyrgyzstan, um, all over, and um, been to most of the states in the United States, all but one. Got to get to Alaska still. But it's more just going into the neighborhoods and seeing what people are reading. And I, I want to do... I want to do the little uh, photo thing where you have the little stick person with you um, <laughs> to do it. But kind of like what John was talking about, seeing how people repurpose uh, everyday items into really some of the coolest libraries. I I've seen literally metal filing cabinets that they've figured out how to seal them up. Um, of course, the the old newspaper uh, 
that you used to pull out newspapers from um, because those were fairly waterproof to begin with to house the newspapers. And like John said, to, to see the creativity of some of these stewards, I feel so inadequate. Mine is just a pretty red with a white top and a glass door or a plexiglass door. But um, probably the neatest thing, though, that I get to see, and I see it in mine and I see it when I travel, is kids riding up on their bicycles, pulling out a book, dropping it in the basket in the front and riding off with a book. And if there's not a greater reward for being a little free library steward than watching a kid pedal up on their tricycle, being pulled in a wagon by mom or dad or on their bicycle and grabbing a book that they can take with them, nothing against adults, but the kids make it like 100% like reward for everything we do of making it available. And so... You know, just seeing all the different creativity the stewards do, I'm in awe. And watching the faces of some of these kids grab a book and, I mean, almost like hug it like it's, you know, a doll or something. It's like, oh, I love this thing. And I've had some of the parents that have used ours thank me that have said their kids are saying their ABCs, saying their numbers, saying animals much earlier because we had some of those early books in our little free library they could grab. And if that doesn't make what we do for little free libraries the most invaluable thing, I don't know what does. Yeah, and I, you know, what for on your creativity end of things, so uh, one up for your destination. Um, so my parents, uh, one of the first things I did with Todd Bull when I joined the board was um, the late Todd Bull, bless his, bless his loving soul, uh, was in this tiny town, uh, the, the islands that my parents are from, which is a series of small islands in the northernmost tip of the Philippines. And so we created um, little free libraries for them. And the great thing about that is, you know, it's a remote place, so they don't have access to as many books. Um, but now, now they do have a lot more through donations. But... They also created a, stories. So a lot of these kids and adults wrote stories. So those became the things that they shared. So when they were creating bamboo little free libraries in these remote tiny, tiny towns, which is really, really wonderful. So John, I'll, I'll go to you about your destination. I know Andrea has, has shared hers and we'll go back as well. So John, let's. Let, what are you, some of yours? Um, is, are there some on your bucket list that you've seen virtually, but also <laughs> physically? Um, everybody has a bucket list, so. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the ones that match the buildings there in front of, whether it's a little church or a little house or an apartment building or, you know, a barn, whatever it may be. I always enjoy seeing those. Uh, one of my favorites here in Victoria is it's a, a 360 degree round library. It looks almost like a grain silo. And the exterior of it is all stained glass. And inside the stained glass strips, they put the spines of books, of famous books like Fahrenheit 451 and The Outsiders and things like that. So you, before you even open the door, you engage with the library by seeing all the spines of the books on the outside. And then you open up the door and it's a 360 degree round kitchen spinning unit inside it, like the kind of thing you would keep your pots and pans on. And uh, it spins around and the books go around as well. So it's it's really well built. It's completely solid because one of my pet peeves is the wibbly wobbly uh, little free library. I like a really solid library. <laughs> so yeah. it's great for that. We've got some nice ones here in town too that use um, repurposed objects like old grandfather clocks, uh, an old stand-up uh, 1930s radio cabinet. Um, oh. I've seen them done out of uh, a china hutch, like an old family china hutch that you would find in your, in your uh, dining room. Um, one of the most interesting but least successful ones I've ever seen here in town is one is completely made out of plexiglass. It's a plexiglass box and the lid opens like that and the books are inside it, which looks really cool, but so much moisture is inside that because the uh -huh. sun beats down yeah. on it and it creates this greenhouse effect inside and all the books are water swollen. Oh. So it's, it looks cool and it kind of matches the house it's in front of, but yeah. practically no, not at all. 
So, uh, Andrew, to, let's go back to you and the bus shelter. I want to, to hear how and how you place your books, how you make that a fun um, destination again, you know, for uh, books and reading. So bus shelters are pretty standard um, in where we are. Um, we, we, our daughter's 24. Uh, we built it out of some, we are repurposers uh, and um, upcyclers. And so we uh, took a tree down on our property and planed it. And uh, we built the bus shelter out of a tree that we had taken down on our property. And it really, it was to keep her safe from the bugs in May and June and from the snow while she was waiting for the bus at the end of our driveway. Um, and so she's, off, gone off to university. We don't need a bus shelter anymore. And it was it was kind of derelict at the end of our driveway. So we decided that we would repurpose it. She had named it Steve her, as her bus shelter. We felt that we couldn't change the name. So we continued it as Steve. We did not purchase any materials for this because we had renovated our house. So we had old windows, old doors that we just repurposed into the, the building. Uh, into the building. So um, it's our actual library is three feet by four feet and it's seven feet tall. Um, and we probably have about 500 books in it, I would say, on any what? given day. Oh. <laughs> and, um, but we were, con we were convinced that we were not going to spend any money on this. So we started with um, some social media, letting people know Steve was coming. We um, had the local paper do a, an article on us asking for donations and then the donations started coming in. So we ended up, one of our first problems actually was having to curate the amount of donations that we got sure. because you know when you say we'll take book donations you get everything, right? Full yeah. sets of encyclopedias, <laughs> you know, religious materials, everything. And so our first job was curating. Yeah. Um, so we have ours all organized into children's, young adult, uh, middle grade, adult fiction, nonfiction, and I have a cookbook section as well. That's we have cool. labels that we've made out of, I, I, I didn't even want to buy the labels, so we went to Home Depot, we borrowed some paint sticks, we cut them in half, and we made labels for all of the um, all of the genres in our library. So um, people have asked us, what you know, how did you decide on the genres? You know, we just, we looked at what we got, we just, we decided, uh, we looked at the books that we had donated we decided how we wanted to organize them so that's an ongoing project and because of the size of our library we do have to keep up with that uh, but um, it, it we have we have not spent a cent on, I'm really proud <laughs> to say that we have not spent a cent on it and the donations we're three years in now and the donations really have not um, we, we did take the donation box away for a while but the donations uh, continue and the books that people are taking are coming back because we do have a stamp in ours. And so we are starting to see the books come back. So I'm happy if the books never come back, but there's yeah. something satisfying about the books coming back yeah. as well. Um, so um, yeah, so it is, uh, it's, it's been a, it's, it's been a joyful uh, project for us and it really is a destination for people because once again, I'll say it, it's in a place where people shouldn't really be coming and people come specifically, they pull up our driveway. We don't often go down. We give them space to sort of, uh, you know, look at the library, but um, occasionally we go down and chat them up and people are always really glad to see us as well. So we actually, we can't, we actually can't see the library from our house. It's because we have sort of a windy driveway. It's kind of a, if you build it and fill it, they will come, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, Bill, I, I loved it on our conversation before we all got started is the whole idea of who can you engage to get involved, whether it's um, students or other, you know, other community folks. Um, how, in, in, even in the process of building or even the idea generation of what can you use, are, do you have some fun tips and ideas of, engaging uh, ideas and I, I did love your 3D project uh, the concept yeah. like hmm you know but yeah so why don't you share some of the ways that people have gotten involved in these kind of builds because you can't do it all alone or at least I'm thinking that you can't do it all alone. No Andrea Andrea touched on it um, there is a lot of groups that really are looking for projects and looking for things to help and one of the ones that I found is if you need a wide variety of good quality books, 
um, if you talk to some of your local churches and ask for people to bring in old children's books, our, our library is kind of sad in comparison to Andrea's. We have two shelves. The lower is children books and the upper is split in half, half adult reader books and the other half is cookbooks because people love the cookbooks um, and stuff. But um, what I found is is getting some of the service organizations involved. Um, I've helped two Boy Scouts with Eagle Scout projects to add two more libraries to our area. And I've helped a couple people who wanted to get libraries connect with their Rotary Club or Optimus or some of the service clubs that are more than willing to donate the materials or donate the money for the materials. Um, and then, like I said, if you go, surprisingly enough, to even schools, um, they trade out some of their books and they have carts uh, that they will give you for books to put in your little free library. And then this year at our county fair, um, the uh, uh, what do you one of the guilds that okay. was, uh, at the county fair yeah. had a donation book list, and I said, "What are you going to do with all your extra books you don't get rid of?" And they yeah. said, "Oh, well, we don't know. Probably just take them to Goodwill or or something like that." I said, "How would you like to donate them to some little free libraries?" <laughs> and, yeah. and so I bought. I got some really nice books, probably about eight boxes, and I just took them to different little free libraries in our area um, and shared the wealth. But I think if, like Andrea is saying, if you contact your local um, paper, we have a local newspaper. We've been written up, and after we got written up, uh, I had two or three boxes of books, and some of them were like brand new, first, you know, late you know, recent books that yeah. people had read that were avid readers and they just, you know, either came up to our door and dropped them off or put them, you know, near, near the library and I, I brought them in. But I, I think you just need to share the information. And when people find out they're there, kind of like you said, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. You also, if you let them know about it, yeah. they will come. And I have found most people are very willing to help what they can. And I know with, I was talking about the kids getting books. Some of the parents have thanked me. It's like, oh, we can now recycle all these kids books that we have so many on. And so they'll bring a half dozen down and then pull one out and put six in. Yeah. And so I've been very lucky that since um, for the last five years of our library, uh, I've never had to go get books. Um, they just keep showing up. Um, like Andrea said, you do have to kind of go through and make sure that none of them are really bizarre. Um, <laughs> but I, I haven't had to pull too many that that have been, you know, not yeah. worth leaving in there. So, so a, a couple of things also come to mind, and and two is one is I, I love how you always thinking of other little free libraries. So th there's a reminder we have our app. So if both for the the little free library destination trip, you know, like a bucket list trip, um, to use our app and the opportunity to look at suggestions. Um, Nancy Wilkin, who's one of our wonderful board members. Um, and uh, Stuart and has so many wonderful little free libraries on the idea of upcycling, which everybody here does, which is fantastic, is, is to use uh, little, you know, vintage books or older outdated books that you may get for an opportunity to upcycle and use things, whether it's words or use covers or things like that, or use them for bookmarks. I think that there are some fun ways and, you know, Mod Podge is your friend. So, you know, lots of really fun things. And then of course, Bill, you had a great suggestion before uh, about creating framed uh, framed area and then putting, you know, some book covers or things like that, or, you know, to kind of promote um, the opportunity for books to, to read or to share. Um, I'll go to there. So one question somebody had is, what do you do with the bizarre books that you pulled? Um, <laughs> so, and then um, John will go to you because the art uh, idea, um, the way in which you use art uh, again is, uh, is really, really fun. So, um, 
some of the, tell, me, tell us again some of the clever things. So Bill, we'll go for you, the bizarre book uh, repurposing. And then John, let's go to you with, you know, what are uh, some additional fun ways that you can, and where can you go to find some of these fun and cool art, art finds for uh, translation into Wolfrey Library tools? What, you, what we were talking about before is just taking old picture frames because they already have a glass front on them and you kind of maybe have to change it out to plex glass because glass yeah. tends to get broken but again run a bead of silicone seals it for you <laughs> and then you can slip uh book covers book uh jackets and things like that 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 you have or that's a good thing to repurpose some of the old books or uh some of the the interesting books that you've had or another one that i've seen is um if you have a day where you're promoting your library and just take pictures of people at your library and put that out because they tend to, if you put something that changes, people tend to come back to your library oh, just to see what changed. Curiosity. Yeah. But again, the one thing, don't be afraid to ask and tell people about your little free library. What I found is more times than not, if you ask nicely um, for every five times you ask, yeah. Three times you'll get what you want, and two times they'll politely say no, and you don't worry about that. Um, but the other three times you get the stuff you need. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think yeah. that it's all about just talking to other people, communication. Yeah, and with volunteers, um, this is an opportunity to also to engage volunteers to the whole idea of sustain other little free libraries. So in also identifying some that need a little bit more love and care, um, this may be great. Um, so we'll start with, with, with you, John, for one more question about wrapping up is, um, what are your plans to build yet another one or help someone <laughs> else build one? Or what's, do you have some dream projects or ideas cooking up there in these creative uh, veins of yours? I do, yeah, yeah. So a uh, future one that I want to build, uh, I've got designs for it and everything like that. I want to build a, a temporary um, little free library. I want to call it the Midnight Mystery Cabinet and have it only appear on the full moons. And um, in here in Victoria, um, I don't know how many people know this, but there's a lot of witches up here in Victoria. So, and I mean like, you know, a couple thousand of us in Victoria. So there's a lot of stuff out there that gets repurposed. So I've got a whole stack of books and old smudge sticks and things like that. So my idea is that I wanna build this little midnight mystery cabinet that has lots of doors and drawers and things to look in. And it only appears like magic on the full moon and then it's gone again. So, <laughs> so I've got a whole design worked up for it and I know exactly where it's gonna go. And it's because it's portable, it'll have to be firmly anchored so nobody walks away with it. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do for sure. Um, I've got sketches for a number of little libraries and it's really just a question of, it's really, it's placement. Like where do they all go? Like in my house, I have one. Um, I would like to have like five or six of them in my house, but you can only have so many on your place. So. It's all about finding somewhere to live and then finding those people who want to host them and then making them a really vibrant and attractive part of the street. You want it to be something that draws people eyes. You want it to be something that people, you know, especially kids go, oh, what's that? Let's go check it out. You want to put it at a height that kids can reach so they don't feel like they can't get it or they're pulling on it and it comes over and lands on top of them, you know? So you've got to think about all those things when it's not just you know, what you're going to build, but what you're going to build, how people are going to interact with it, you know, how the function of it really works better for the form. You know, you can have whatever form you want, but if it doesn't function, it's not very good. So, and then how to make it vibrant in the neighborhood. How does it reflect the neighborhood? Is it in a park? Do you paint it to match the park? Um, one of the ones I did for a city park, we got a, a, a grant from our city council to put that one in. And I made sure it looked like a series of birdhouses for this park so yeah. that um, it kind of fit in with the design of the park itself. So every, long before I ever built a single thing, I went and I sat in the park and I just watched how people were using the space, where it might go and what it would look like. So, yeah. yeah. Andrea, about you, do you have a wish list or like, you know what, if I could, do another yeah. one. Let me do this. Well, our wish list is um, because this all started as a downsizing project because we are anticipating a move in the next <laughs> few years. Our worry is who will take over Steve the Little Free Library. 
had an amazing conversation with a young couple about a month ago and I shared with them that that you know that was my plan that was my concern and they volunteered to take it over and so we're actually starting to think about what that might look like when we move it from well basically we're going to move it about eight kilometers down so I'm thrilled that someone loves it enough that they want to take it over mm. um, and so um, and then I'm not sure what our next one will be it'll it'll depend on where we land uh, yeah. I think we're, we're going to go from rural to city and so um, I look forward to being in a city where hopefully there there will be 650 little free libraries for me to take part uh, to to participate with yeah and and bill I'll end with you and then also i know that for some people if whether it's an hoa or something um that that's my final question to any any of you who had to navigate that so bill are, what's cooking in that creative brain of yours in terms of little free libraries and um does anybody have tips of you know maybe there might be a challenge from whether it's an HOA neighborhood association, do you navigate that? So take it away, Bill. I, I'll share the idea of my, my futuristic one is to figure out a way to 3D print the panels that snap together Ooh. and create <laughs> an easy um, little free library build that you could even unsnap. Because I've seen people take the ones when they're going camping that are incredible. And I'm like, wow, that would be so cool. But yeah. just one that you could put up and, and take down if you were in an area like Alaska where it just isn't probable to keep it up in the winter or if you're in a rainforest area that rains too much or whatever. But um, So that's my futuristic one. Um, I do know in our area we have a lot of the HOAs, and it can be real interesting. The biggest problem isn't the HOAs, it's you get some person who just for whatever reason doesn't um, like the idea or concept and you have to kind of win them over mm -hmm. um, in the HOA and you catch a lot of flies with honey and, and the best way that I found if you have a naysayer is try to get them nicely involved because then they feel like they own the project. Right. And they tend to be on your side as opposed to against you. So um, somebody just asked a question. HOA yeah. is a homeowners yeah. association. So and it's rules and regulations for your neighborhood to supposedly keep it the way it was and and things. But I tend to try to get those people involved. And that tends to alleviate a lot of the problems. Yeah. And uh, Alexi was also saying, don't forget that some of these little free libraries can be indoors and um, that may be an additional solution to, I, th I think uh, on the uh, one story's response on a homeowners association, they didn't want it to make a permanent part of the property. So they actually put it in a, uh, well, almost like a planter's pot and so that it was mm -hmm. mobile. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of gets around the permanent structure into um, the the space and um, but it and it's, it has that mobility to it and um, I think it's it's your creative response to all of it and um, and that's really really exciting I I I'm very I, I somebody also converted a chicken coop old kid chicken chicken coops sure. yeah. to little free libraries and um, a lot of fun you know there's the and students and educators and librarians makerspace is also another fun group to to um, engage. So I'm very, so somebody asked, the Tana asked, can they be on public or state-owned property like a college? Um, yes, I mean, in fact, you know, there are a lot of colleges that have created some of them. It depends on, you have to go to whatever association or organization for some, <coughs> excuse me, um, parks and recreation, some people, uh, it's an easy process to get it approved, but some it's more challenging because I remember I experienced that in um, Washington, D.C., where we were putting some up. Um, so we have, you know, it, don't forget to check our chats and then the Facebook page, um, excuse me, I'm going to cough, though, <coughs> um, have good suggestions on how to address that and how to engage. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, so any, any questions that you guys have for each other while I cough away? 
<laughs> I'll do, there was just a comment in the chat that I'll jump on to. Um, somebody mentioned that there's a broken uh, little free library near their house right now. I would say that upkeep and repair of libraries is probably the second most important thing to having books in yeah. your library. You've got to build it to last. You've got to have enough parts to repair it so you don't have to do a major re rebuild. And you really have to engage with your community to help out with the libraries that are not getting repaired. Quite often, I'll walk around with a little screwdriver or a little hammer, and if I see something that needs tweaking, I just go ahead and do it. Yeah, and there are some that are abandoned. So you, you know, because maybe this was an Eagle Scout project that, you know, that crew has moved on. But I think perhaps, I think that's the neat thing I think about the app, and Shelby just noted that, and I was about ready to say that too, is on the app, you can report that there's a little free library that's damaged, the little free library will reach out to the steward or engage, you know, um, people can identify one that needs some extra love and care. And that's going to be part of the, our, you know, steward, you know, outreach and connection is, you know, let's find the ones that need that extra attention or mm -hmm. books or things like that. Um, I think that's a really, really good opportunity for us to, you know, because it is about building a community around the books and around the Little Free Libraries. Um, and very often there are there are multiple ones, whether it's for a school or public library. And some may just be in an area that needs just some extra attention and this or the steward has moved on or uh, things like that. So um, I think that's another way to think about what's what's possible. Um, I think, I think, are we done? This is, I could go on forever because I just want to pick your brain uh, a million ways to spend day. <laughs> so I'm, I'm coming away with a lot of ideas. Um, Lexi Shelby, um, I think go to our website, go to the Pinterest page and the, you know, go to all of our three wonderful stewards, um, follow them, uh, find out what else is going on because it's a lot of fun um, and just get excited. Don't, don't limit yourself. The possibilities are endless. Um, I think that's great. So I'll let you take it away, Lexi. Thank you guys. It was been great talking with you. Thanks, Anita, and thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Um, this, this, uh, the topic of building your own little free library and maintaining little free libraries is one we get questions on all the time, and it's a topic we've wanted to cover and talk to stewards about for a long time, so I'm glad we were able to do that. Um, as always, attendees will receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the replay, so you can share it with a friend who's been thinking about um, building their own little free library or revisit some of the tips we have. I'll also share the show notes, which include um, some links and the tips and tricks we talked about today. And you can sign up for the giveaway, which is a chance to win one of two DIY library bundles, which will include an official charter sign so you can build and register your first or your next little free library and a copy of the little free libraries and tiny sheds book, which includes um, all kinds of great build plans and inspiration. So be sure to keep an eye out for that email and enter that giveaway if you're hoping to start your first or your next little free library. We, the LFL team, has also put together a brand new video outlining the steps of assembling our library kits. Um, Anita mentioned during the show today that our kits have come a long way. Um, and they really, really have, thanks to our product and operations team, they are really easy to assemble and a lot of fun to do um, with a friend or your family. So we put together a brand new video of my colleague Dan and I assembling that library, and we're going to make that available. It should be ready shortly. Um, so you can take a look at that, see how easy it is, and um, check out a version with some detailed instructions so you know what to expect. If you haven't already, we encourage you to follow Little Free Library on our social media pages and sign up for our e-newsletter so you can be in the know about exciting Little Free Library news. And that is all for today. Thanks so much for joining us.